For those of you who are here to see the AI, you're in the right place. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit here about whether AI chat is a, another passing fad or whether it's in fact the future of customer service. Um, who am I? My name is Bob Caldwell. I'm the founding partner of EventBots. We made Connie. How many of you guys have talked to Connie? All right. So, uh, giant spoiler alert, we're going to say that AI chatbots here is the future of customer service. But if you want excitement, here's a picture of me going down a roller coaster with my family at Hershey Park, right? So, you know, the suspense of whether or not it's a, a passing fad or customer service, I think, is out of the bag, but we're going to have fun. Okay, let's talk about what a fad is. I always like to start with definitions, right? A fad basically is something that becomes a craze, lots of people get excited about it, there's no intrinsic value doesn't last that long. Uh, typically a craze. We take a look at a couple of fads from recently, right? We can say, okay, remember a couple of years ago, Pokemon, everybody's walking around with their phones. I mean, even I got involved, I go on a walk with my family, like picking up my Pokemon, right? A few years before that, how about the fidget spinners? How many of you guys have these sitting in a cabinet drawer somewhere where there's like 6,000 of them? They don't have any intrinsic value. They're kind of fun to play with when you're bored, right? The one before that, whoop. I went too far. How about Cabbage Patch? You guys remember Cabbage Patch? That was a big one back in the 90s. This is a younger crowd. Maybe you guys don't remember Cabbage Patch, but maybe the greatest fad of all time, mullets. This was one of the greatest hair bands, which is a, a bit of an incremental improvement on the mullet. The hair band of the 80s are called White Snake, but as you know, fads go away, right? I got a White Snake fan out there, and we all know that you know, the, the big hair thing's gonna go away. So I wanted to show you a picture of White Snake today. This is from the new album. Maybe it didn't go completely away. They still love the big hair. I guess, you know, what goes around comes around. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about business fads. A couple of them that we've all seen out there, right? One of my favorites is your, your, your office has a playground. This one has a, a giant slide in the middle of the office because there's nothing that gives you productivity and success like going up and down a slide in your business clothes. Or my other favorite is the ping pong table, right? The number of startups, you got this great ping pong table and everyone's gonna play ping pong together and it's gonna promote diversity and excitement and you know competition, it's gonna unload creativity, but mostly it ends up being a conference table, right? Um, so from a fad perspective, it seems like a good idea, but it doesn't quite get there. Okay, let's take another step forward. now. If you look at chatbots, we've all heard about chatbots in the past couple of years, right? And I went and randomly picked a couple of uh, uh, headlines just from the last couple of months, right? So you see this one, so, you know, chatbots are gonna impact our lives. They're gonna fundamentally transform FinTech by, 20, by 2020. You know, even a better one, right? Billions of dollars in, in transactional volume is gonna happen in chatbots. But now I want to be fair, I went and pulled the other set of uh, headlines from just the last couple of days, right? And, and they're completely different. Why didn't chatbots live up to their hype, right? Does your chatbot, does your company really need a chatbot? And finally, my personal favorite, 50 shades of chatbots, what to do when the sexiness is gone, right? Now, I didn't realize chatbots were that sexy, I and mean, they are to me, I'm a lead investor in the company, but like on the whole, they're not all that sexy. Now, what happened here? Right? How, how do we have in the same six month period of time, people talking about it's the future of the world and, and in the same six months, it doesn't work and you don't need it? Well, I want to explore that for a second, right? And it really gets down to a, a great philosopher who says, said it was uh, easy to make promises, but it's really tough work to, to keep them. Maybe you know who Boris Johnson is. He's the PM of, uh, of the UK right now. And I think this was originally about Brexit, but it could be also applied to technology generally, right? Hey, everything's going to be great, but now we got to figure out how the hell to actually do this, right? So that's, that's, that's the starting point. Now, one of the things you look at technology, and this is a pretty standard technology curve, right? So on the front side, a new technology comes out and everybody says, oh my gosh, this is going to be the most amazing thing ever. And they all think about the thousands of things they can do with this technology. And so it gets more and more expectations, more and more excitement, more and more hype, right? And it gets this peak, right? The peak of inflated expectations. And then people actually try to deploy that technology and realize, well, wait a second, this is bloody hard. This, it turns out it's, it's not just plug and play. This could be really difficult. And you get to the trough of disillusionment, right? Right? So that, that peak, the peak of uh, expectations is kind of like the ping pong table at the office. Oh, hell yeah, we're all going to play ping pong. This is going to be awesome. Right? You get to the trough of disillusionment, and then you get to the plateau of productivity. You actually deploy the technology, and things start to happen. 
the technology is adding value, it's bringing improvement, it's improving productivity, it's driving success, right? That's kind of like when you get to the ping pong table becomes a conference table, right? You know, again, you're deploying technology to solve a problem. Now, what we're really talking about is disruptive innovation and sustaining innovation, right? Innovation generally, there's two kinds. Disruptive and sustaining. Now, I want to go through it. Sustaining innovation is incremental changes. You make a little change and it gets better, and another little change and it gets better, and another little change and it gets better, and you're driving success. Disruptive is, hey, we're just going to blow the doors open and create a whole new market. So let's give you guys a couple of examples of each. All right? So if I go to sustaining innovation, this is the Gillette Razor, right? Gillette started with one blade, and they said, you know what's better than one blade? Two blades. And they got two blades going. I said, you know what's even better than two blades? Three blades. And you know what's better than four blades? Five blades. Now you got five blades with lotion and it vibrates when it's safe. Those are all those are all sustaining incremental innovations, right? How about another one? Who here loves Coca-Cola? Fantastic. Right? Cherry Coke. You know what that is? That's a sustaining innovation. It's just Coke with some cherry syrup in it. Right? Then they have grape coke and other coke. They're just taking the same thing and adding a little bit to make it better. Right? And then finally, the, the king of all sustaining innovation, Apple. Right? Apple started with this really disruptive innovation, which was their original iPhone. And ever since then, they've been like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make it a little bigger, a little wider, a little shallow, shallower. We're going to take something off. We're going to add something to it. We're going to add stuff to this. That's sustaining innovation. Now, let's talk about disruptive innovation all right so disruptive innovation taking a quick look the personal computer was a massively disruptive innovation right back in the old days we had to type it all out put it on a typewriter all of a sudden now you can save the file you can transfer the file you could change it without a lot of work that was massively disruptive how about the internet kind of disruptive to the ability to share information and technologies right and then finally you think the taxi drivers think that Uber's a little disruptive, right? Those are the differences between sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. I want to go over one that I think is a particularly great opportunity. How many of you guys remember Blockbuster? You're old enough to remember Blockbuster, right? All right. How do you guys remember back in 1999, it was like Friday night, and you walk in the Blockbuster, and you see all the titles there, like... You got all, there's like eight copies of Notting Hill. Oh, hell yeah, it's going to be a good date night for Bobby C. We're going to have some fun, right? But, you know, they did a pretty good job. They got up to 9,000 stores and over $6 billion in revenue, right? So they were essentially everywhere you went, blockbusters that were available to rent videos. So what happened? There's some innovators that came along, right? So you take a look at them, there's two of them, right? Netflix and Redbox. Now, you may just remember, Netflix started as mail order, right? Now, when it started, it was mail order, and it was valuable. You know why? Because all of a sudden, it was easy access to information. You can, you can get what you want. You can get the, the, the uh, titles you want. They deliver it right to your home, right? There were no late fees. Think about this for a second. Hundreds of billions of dollars of blockbuster revenue were driven by late fees. They made money penalizing their customers. It was a key part of their revenue source. And all of a sudden, Netflix came along and said, hey, wait a second, there's going to be no late fees. And Redbox, now they had another, another innovation, a little bit different, right? Again, incremental, right? Sustaining innovation because they said, hey, listen, we're gonna, we don't need a big store. We're going to put this right at the, in front of Walmart or the gas station, wherever you go, right? You, it, you can get easy access. It's right there and it's very quick and you can return it anywhere. Remember what a... I don't know how many of you guys did that, but it's like, I can return this to any red box? Oh my God, this is awesome, right? So those were really big. Those were sustaining innovations. Let's talk about what happened when Netflix decided to get disrupted. What did they do? They said, wait a second. We don't have to mail it to you. You can just download it, right? This, this was revolutionary, right? Think about it. All of a sudden, you had instant access. There was an unlimited number of titles. How many times did you go to Blockbuster and you wanted to go see Titanic or, or uh, Matrix or whatever it was, and the, the title wasn't available? All of a sudden, at Netflix, there's an unlimited number of titles to be delivered. Instant access for exactly what you want and a flat fee. And then most importantly, 
and this is something that is incredibly important, you could use the device you already have. You could use your TV, you could use your laptop, you could use your phone, you could use your tablet, you could use your Xbox, you could use your PlayStation, it didn't matter. All of a sudden they completely blew open the market. Everything changed. And all of a sudden people went from, hey, this is kind of an interesting idea, I'm kind of into it, until they told their friends, they became absolute zealots to say, you've got to try Netflix, you've got to try Netflix, right? That's what happened. So now let's take a look at the sales chart. Blockbuster was doing great. You see, in the early days, you had some sustaining disruption, right? Some sustaining market market push, where essentially they weren't destroying Blockbuster, but they were certainly starting to impact their sales volume. And then what happened? Bam! They got to a certain point, and everybody said, "I have to do this. It's so much easier. It's so much cheaper. It's so much more convenient for me." And they took off. And so if you look at it, by the way, Blockbuster had an opportunity. Wow, that was awesome. You should be happy you had those on, although imagine it amplified it through here, right? That just, that just scared me a little bit. The, uh, the, uh, if you take a look, uh, Blockbuster had an opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million in 1999. And they said, you know what? We don't think this thing's going to work out, right? As of June 2019, they had $17 billion in last 12 month sales. I think it's kind of working out for Netflix. There's some other issues, I get it, I get it. But they fundamentally changed it, they completely destroyed the landscape of rental videos and uh, have made a huge difference, right? Now, they did most of that with their own innovation, but sometimes there's also outside market factors, and I promise, I'm going to get back to chatbots in a second, right? There's outside market factors. And what were the outside market factors in this world? Access to broadband. All of a sudden, if you look at if you look at access to broadband, we're bumping along in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, it's like 30%, 40%. 2013, we get to over 70% of the United States has broadband. What that means is everybody can now very quickly pull down these videos. And that's when all of a sudden all of these internal and external factors are coming together to make it good. Okay. Now, let's talk about AI because that's why you guys came to see it, I think. Or you're just tired and you wanted to sit down and say, hey, this guy looks like he's going to tell me some funny stuff, so let's see what happens, right? All right. So when we think about AI, you know, in, the, in modern media, it's like it's an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-understanding technology. It's going to rule our lives, which is totally cool and totally bullcrap, right? That's what Hollywood wants you to think. That's not what AI is. That's not where AI goes. But now, AI is all around us. How many of you guys used AI somewhere in your life today? Yeah, pretty much you should all put your hand up because AI is, AI is everywhere. Let's take a look at a couple of quick examples, right? So if we take a look, you know, uh, one of the most interesting AIs is Flippy, the burger flipper for a San Diego burger chain, right? So Flippy does two things. He's a robot, but he also looks at the meat and determines when it's ready to flip, which is kind of cool, right? So that's artificial intelligence, making you lunch, right? And you say, okay, how about Aura, the AI toothbrush, right? Now, I didn't realize we needed an AI toothbrush, but apparently we do. And essentially what this does is you put it in your mouth and you brush your teeth and you do a thing, and it's, it's mapping how many strokes per minute you are spending on each tooth to maximize the appropriate amount of dental hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. But it's there, right? And then, of course, robot bees. Scientists have now created AI robot bees that will fly out into the, 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 the fields and pollinate flowers, because we actually need more bees to pollinate flowers, right? I won't get into why we need more bees. Let's just say we're using AI to solve that problem, right? Okay, let's look at another one. Sorry, I'm advancing. How about in sports, right? This is one of the biggest areas of AI utilization. Uh, uh, Ron from, from National Sports uh, 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 Forum is here, one of the great, great uh, shows you guys should definitely go to if you're in the sports world. But if you look at how AI is being used in sports, remember five, six, eight years ago, you know, it was a two-point game, it was a lay point, layup game, and now Seth Curry comes along and just starts banging threes, right? Because AI proved that this is what you do to score more points. You look at, this is a, a soccer example. They're looking at the proper spacing of your of your different players to deliver the most opportunity to score a goal. Visa, 
Visa's using AI uh, to, to catch bad guys, right? So essentially they're looking at mass volume processing. So in the world of merchants, bad merchants, criminals, when they steal your credit card, here's how they make money. You guys want to understand how the criminals make money when they steal your card? They process a dollar, right? But they do it a million and a half times a day because they stole a million and a half cards. And so they process a 99 cent transaction because you're not going to look at 99 cents. You look at 99 cents, you're like, I probably signed up for something that you don't worry about. So what Visa is looking for is using AI to find these massive hits of transactions coming through at odd times in an unusual way, right? Which is using AI to solve crime. Artificial intelligence. AI stands for artificial intelligence. Okay. Now, an inflatable draft. AI. You're probably asking, okay, Buck, I got the toothbrush maybe, the burger flipper, but how the hell is an inflatable draft got AI? I'll tell you. One of my buddies was getting married, was having an outdoor wedding, happened to comment to me one night when we're drinking that he loved giraffes. So I went and bought a dozen inflatable 12 foot giraffes and had them shipped to his house for his wedding, but I didn't tell him they were from me, right? Now you're still going, that's kind of interesting, but where's the AI? Because when I bought it, Amazon said, you know what? You also should buy using AI based on your purchase of a dozen inflatable giraffes, an inflatable rideable bull that you can put in the pool which I bought and delivered to his house without any explanation, right? So again, AI is a little bit of everywhere. Okay, now, let's understand how AI really deploys itself. Artificial intelligence is really good at two things. The first is crunching massive amounts of data. This is looking at all those sports uh, films. It's looking at all those transactions at Visa. It's looking at those things. And the other thing it does is repetitive tasks. It's repetitive tasks done again and again and again and again and again. It does them perfectly, exactly the same way, every time. Now, here's where we get to the interesting part of why you're sitting here. It turns out customer service is a ridiculously repetitive task. Answering the phone and giving service to your members, to your attendees, to those people that you're interacting with. It's giving them the same information. In many cases, you've already given them before. You've already emailed them. It's on your website, but they still ask it. How many of you guys run a show and you've had somebody walk up to, to you while you're sitting under a six-foot banner that says registration, and they're like, excuse me, do you know where registration is? Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? So the reality is just that, right, is that customer service is repetitive, which means that AI has an opportunity to dry, draw success in there. So, I want to real quickly think about what it is we're actually trying to do in customer service. And if you look at it, I polled a bunch of experts, I read a bunch of books, and it said, look, this is what customers really want, right? I want you to greet me, respect me, value me, help me, wow me, listen to me, wow me, and finally invite me back. This is what the customers want, right? So if you want to deliver that to them, you need three things, right? You need to understand the customer needs generally. You need to choose technology that's going to help you deliver against that. And finally, you need to know what's really happening in your customer's brain. Because as it turns out, our brains are changing very rapidly, and there's an opportunity to understand how to use that. All right, is everybody still with me? Yeah. All right, got some nodding heads. Good. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about basic problems. How many of you guys have heard of uh, uh, Abraham Maslow, right? psychologist back in the 60s. I don't want to take you back to Psych 101, but he said, hey, listen, up until then, it was all about sort of the Freudian problems. Your life was about your mom or it's about your dad, it's about your mom and dad, and all the weird things you thought about with them. And he said, no, no, it's about a series of problems. And you solve these problems and you can achieve a higher self. And he called it his hierarchy, right? So it's essentially a pyramid. And fundamentally he said, look, you got to solve the stuff at the bottom to get to the top. So in order to be the best self you can be, you got to solve the basic problems. And down bottom is like the physiological stuff. Hey, we need air, we need water, we need sex. Not the good fun sex, but the let's continue the human race sex kind of stuff, right? Then you take the next step up, you say, okay, hey, we need security and I need resources. Then you get to the love and belonging and friendship and family and, and intimacy. Well, there's the fun sex part, right? Then you step another step on esteem and finally you get to the top and you have self-actualization. You can be the best you that you can be. Okay, how does this apply to events or customer service? Well, we would posit that only once you've delivered all these for your members and your attendees, 
can they achieve self-actualization at the top? And a lot of you are going, okay, I sort of intellectually understand, but can you give me a practical example of how this plays out? Suppose you've had a big gulp, right? Or four cups of coffee, right? We've all been there. You drank a bunch of liquid and you say, you know what, I need to visit the restroom. And you start to walk towards the restroom and someone comes up and starts talking to you, right? They could be giving you the cure to cancer and all you can hear is Charlie Brown's teacher going wah, 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 because you got to solve the problem down here before you can get up here, all right? That's a real simple example of how the pyramid works, okay? Now, I want to take another opportunity and talk about the job to be done. All right. So Clay Christensen, we referenced him earlier when we talked about innovation and uh, sustaining versus uh, disruptive innovation. Um, but he came up with this concept of the job to be done, which basically said every single time you make a choice to use something or buy something, you're about to drink water. You're hiring that water to hydrate you. Maybe get rid of the cotton mouth, maybe get rid of the hangover, any of those things. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. And, and that's what you're doing. So if you take a look at this morning, I hired a cup of coffee to deliver caffeine. It was not a good cup of coffee. It was at the Hilton. It was frankly a crappy cup of coffee, but it did the necessary job. I needed some caffeine to get me going in the morning. Right. I've been at the beach for two weeks. I actually haven't worn shoes for two weeks. So I hired these shoes to not look like a fool in my flip flops and generally be comfortable because they're a little bigger than they should be in my feet are, you know, feeling comfortable. Right. So you're hiring things to do a job. And when we look at technology, you need to make sure you understand what do you want that technology to do for your organization? Because all too often, remember that, that disillusionment, the, 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 all the hype, we think it's going to do everything. You've got to be very thoughtful about what you want the bot or what you want technology to do. Okay. I'm going to give you one other case study. Clay Christensen was hired to sell milkshakes for McDonald's, right? And he said, okay, this is going to be pretty easy, right? Because, you know, what do you hire a milkshake to do, right? Is it deliver sweet goodness? Is it go along with the meal? Is it to drown your sorrows in calories? What is it? Well, it turns out it was none of these. Now, I want to ask you guys, when do you think they found they sold the most milkshakes during the day as a percentage of sales? What time of day does McDonald's sell the most milkshakes? Shout it out if you can. What's that? Is there, what time of day? What time? Night, night time? Three o'clock in the afternoon. Any other answers? Afternoon? Afternoon? I got a lot of heads nodding. Nope, it was breakfast. They sell the most, yeah, right? And everybody does the same thing. I call that the puzzle dog lip. Right? It's the puzzle dog lip. Right? They sell the most milkshakes as a percentage of sales at breakfast. And Clay Tom, Clay, Clay Christensen and his guys, they were just as puzzled as all you guys were. They're like, well, why? They started asking people and they said, well, it's because it fits in my cup holder and it lasts about 45 minutes and it fills me up all the way to breakfast or to, to sort of my mid-morning break and it's not messy. It doesn't go everywhere. So all of a sudden, it turns out, right, milkshakes were not competing with other milkshakes, right? That's not what the technology was hired to do. It's not to be a, a great milkshake. No, no, no. They were competing with croissants and yogurt that when you open it up, it explodes all over your blouse or your tie, or, or uh, messy breakfast sandwiches, right? So it's understanding what the technology was meant to do. In this case, it was meant to deliver food. Okay, let's, one final thing, and I'm gonna dig hard into the chatbot world. Understanding your customers. In the last 20 years, all our brains have changed, right? So how many of you guys remember when you were growing up, how many of you guys remember your childhood friends' phone numbers? Right? Right? So I'll stand back here so you know I can't see. So my buddy, right? Jeff Erskine, 7421895. Greg Ellis, 7494324. John Murphy, 7494282. My mom, 7426394. I haven't called most of these people for 35 years, but I still remember it. I dropped my 15-year-old off at boarding school last week. His number begins with 903. I can't remember the rest of it, right? Okay. Now, how about this? How many of you guys remember my kids always ask me, hey, Dad, when you were growing up, how did you make plans to be with people? Well, we, we actually just showed up. Like, you, know, you, you made plans, you just showed up. You didn't have to text and get there. How many of you guys, when you were starting your career, had a map in your phone, right? You actually had a physical map. All of these things have been replaced. 
right? We call it the alexification of life. Your attendees, your members, your customers have become alexified. They are used to being able to, in every corner of their life, ask a question and instantly get an answer, right? What touchdown had the most, mo or what uh, tight end had the most uh, touchdowns ever? Yeah, Anthony Gates. All right, how do you bake a souffle? Fantastic. New York Times will give you a video, show you how to do it, right? How do I get to grandma's house? There's a map I pulled this morning. Two different ways I can get to my mom's house, right? All of it available in seconds. And say you're, you're throwing an event at the Javits Center. Absolutely, your attendees there, their whole life, they can ask a question, get an answer. They walk in the front door, ask a question at your event, and they get crickets. All of a sudden, that instant gratification is no longer available, right? So it's about getting that information. I was fortunate enough to be at the ASAE conference in, in uh, Columbus about 10 days ago. And uh, after watching the, the events they had, I snuck into the Queen concert and uh, went into Queen. And, and, and as Freddie Mercury said, I want it all, I want it now. And that's what your members and attendees want. And so what if there were a technology that had a 95% correct response rate, that had a 98% open rate, that everybody had in their hand and they knew how to use, didn't require downloads and could give you access to other information, everything from badges to personalized schedules to any of that other data. And what if it were available now? That'd be kind of cool. I'm going to go back to Boris Johnson. It's easy to make promises, right? It's hard to make them work. In our world, we say it's easy to build a bot, but it's really, really hard to build one that works. And so I want to walk through how to think about bots. There's really two types of bots. There's the rigid structured bots. We've all seen this. You go to a website and it says, I can help you with this and this and this. And as it turns out, you don't want any one of those one thing, things and you ask for something else and they say, oh, I can help you with this and this and this. It is a craptastic customer service experience. We are not going to talk about rigid bots. If anyone talks to you about rigid bots for customer service, you should probably run the other way. All right, we're going to talk about deep conversational bots. We're talking about comp bots that allow your customers to ask questions the way they want to and get the answer you would like to deliver to them. All right, that's an important thing. Now, when we say <laughs> artificial intelligence, we're talking about natural language processing. That's the ability for the technology to understand what your customer is asking and deliver the answer you want delivered. Now, the beautiful thing about bots, they work 24-7. They don't show up late, drunk, hungover, pissed off, the cat missed the litter box or any of that stuff. They do what they're supposed to do, right? And finally, they deliver that deep conversation. So what do we mean by deep conversation? Up here, you see it. Pretty simple question. Where is the restroom? Right? That's a pretty simple question. But as it turns out, it's not simple at all. It's actually quite complex because restroom is a synonym for ladies and gents and loo and powder room and water closet and head and cropper and porta potty and literally 212 other things. So you could just as easily say, where is it? You could say, please help me find the, show me the, where on the map is the, how do I get to the, or my personal favorite, I gotta pee, right? We had people put that in the chat box, right? And if you look at all this, the bottom line is, in every one of those cases, if someone came up to any one of you or your staff and asked a question, you would understand what they want and you would deliver them the answer, the bathrooms are out to the right, okay? You want a bot that does the same thing. Okay, what do we mean by multi-channel? Because right now, most bots are delivered in a single channel. They're delivered just in Facebook or they're delivered just on the web. What multi-channel means is the ability to deliver the bot in a bunch of different places, SMS, web chat, WhatsApp, Twitter, Viber, any of those. Now, by far, the most popular channels for, S or for chatbots are SMS and web chat. SMS is just text. Everybody got text, right? Okay. All right. Now, why is text so popular? It has a 98% open rate. I have face-to-face -face conversations that don't have a 98% open rate, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty crazy that way. All right. Now, let's take a look and say, well, why is the web so exciting? Right? Because with two lines of code, you can Alexify your website. You can put two lines of code, put a, a chatbot on your website, and deliver exactly what your customers want. They can ask a question and get an answer about just about anything you want. Okay? 
Now, that means your messages get read, whether they're ad hoc, so they're sent out uh, contemporaneously, or they're scheduled. Hey, don't forget, at 8 a.m., we have this uh, keynote speaker. Hey, turns out that the, the power's out, so please come in an hour later, right? Ad hoc versus scheduled messages. Okay. Now, all chatbots have two components. I'm going to give you the backbone of chatbots real quick, right? There's the template. These are all the things you want the chatbot to answer, and the library. These are the answers to those questions, and who's allowed to see them? Because the two people can ask the same question of a chatbot and get a different answer on purpose. How? Because the chatbot knows who you are, right? So a regular attendee says, what time's dinner? Main hall, six o'clock. A VIP, your board member, one of your key customers says, what time's dinner? 6 p.m., Bruce, Chris, we're gonna take you there. All right, you can deliver different answers to different audience members based on who they are using this technology. I see some heads shaking going, oh, that gets kind of interesting, right? Okay, now, how much do you want a chatbot to do? Like, what can it do? What can do anything? But you gotta choose, right? Because I, I'm guessing that nobody has an unlimited budget, right? So you have to choose between what we call scope, how much do you want it to do? This gets back to what is the job to be done and scale for how long, for how many, on how many channels. Obviously a chatbot for one day, for a short meeting for 12 people is gonna be less expensive than a bot for 100,000 people in a week long festival, right? There's just more to it, right? So thinking through that one. All right, now a lot of you are kind of thinking, I can see, I see it in your eyes, I do this a lot, right? You're going, okay, you get to ask a question, get an answer, ask a question, get an answer, ask a question, get an answer. What happens when you get to, uh, I don't know, what happens when the bot doesn't know? Well, we conveniently call that an I don't know, an IDK, right? And it's really interesting because an I don't know is actually really, really powerful, right? First thing to remember, I don't knows are not bad, right? We did the National Restaurant Association up in, in Chicago, 100,000 people. And one of the guys asked me, he said, well, why didn't the body answer the question, where's the best steak in Chicago? And I said, because that's not its job. Its job's not to answer the best steak in Chicago, because it turns out there's Yelp and Google and Open Table. Its job was to tell you who was speaking at one o'clock and how to get to the right exhibitor and uh, uh, what time dinner was and, and where the reception was. That was its job. It was not about where the best steak was, right? So I don't know are not necessarily bad. Here's the other thing. Every time a bot gets an I don't know, you should be notified of it so you can see what your customers are really asking and understand, hey, is the bot doing its job and getting where it needs to go? Now, the other thing that's really powerful about an I don't know is if the bot's not been trained on that question, what's it going to do? It's going to move your customer to the other customer service channel you want them to go to. It could be, please visit the uh, customer service booth outside, call Susie, here's her number, please send an email, or if it's on your website, it can answer a question all day. If it doesn't know the answer, go to your human staff, but at 5 p.m. it says, here's an email, we'll deal with it later, right? Again, it gives you the opportunity to drive to another customer service channel that makes sense for you, okay? All right, now, I want to talk a little bit, one last thing about, about the power of data, right? What's the most important piece of data you guys all have? Like one one piece of information. You can't hear me or you can't, you can't. Most, what's that? Customer data. Customer data. Most people say social security number at a personal level, but thank you for jumping in, right? Social security number, because you look at it, if somebody came up to you the, on the street and said, hey, give me your social security number, you're going to say no, preceded by a few other choice words, I'm sure, right? But the reality is, if you go to a bank and say, hey, I'd like to get a loan, you'll happily give them your social so you can get all the information, you know, get the information you need. Well, we would argue that your cell phone is actually the most powerful piece of data you have. It's also a 10-digit number. It's also unique. It also ties to you, but not only ties to your individuality, you can talk on it, you can text on it, you can upload and download information on it, and it can tell you where you are geographically, right? So understanding your customers and your ability to communicate over that device becomes incredibly, incredibly powerful. Now, what we mean by that is we believe bots build community. Why? How many of you guys used Connie today? You saw Connie. Okay, a bunch of hands went up. We're gonna we're gonna do a quick demo in a second of some cool stuff, right? If you use Connie, you opened a channel. The SMS channel is open. But let me ask this: How many of you guys have text on your phone? Right? It's absolutely ubiquitous. How many of you guys have the 
Connect app on your phone. Oh, hey, yeah, not as many hands went up. Well, here's the thing. When you have shows and other events, your customer might get the app. At the end of the show, they're going to take it off. They're going to turn it off, but they're not turning off SMS. So you can now communicate with people throughout the year. So maybe six months from now, you say, hey, would you like to get the early bird rate for next year's show? Click here. Your membership is due to, uh, to expire. Please click here to renew. Would you like to sign up to get swag or to get a discount on swag at the end of the event? Click here. Right? Phenomenal interaction and reach rates. It becomes incredibly, incredibly powerful. I'm going to give you a couple of real world examples in just a second. Now, thus far, I have been all about rainbows and unicorns, about how wonderful chatbots are. Let me give you the things you should ask a chatbot vendor when you're interviewing them to get them into your world. All right? It's pretty straightforward. The first thing, do they have multiple available channels? Right? A chatbot vendor who only operates in one channel is not giving you the opportunity to meet your audience where they want to talk. All right? The next thing, we just did a new slide, so I got to look at it. Right? What is the scope of the chatbot? Right? This gets back to should this chatbot be three, four questions, a rigid chatbot, or can you ask 50, 100 questions of the chatbot, topic areas, right? That becomes very powerful. What is the correct response rate? First of all, most chatbot vendors don't even track this. This is, did the bot understand the question and deliver the right answer? Our correct response rate is over 95%, right? Which is better than humans in a call center. Um, how are your I don't knows processed? Every bot vendor gets I don't knows. How are they processed? How do you go view them? You want to be able to look at them because it's important. It's a written record of what your customer asked. Literally, a chatbot gives you a written record of every single question that your, your, uh, your uh, customers asked, right? Can you do enhanced features like delivering the badge, uh, doing uh, uh, networking, uh, exhibitor search, all this other stuff? You want to have access to additional information, not just Q&A, right? Do you get the full DI? And then how long does it take to build? It really should only take six to eight weeks to build a really full featured bot. And then finally, is there a live demo? If you're looking at a, at a bot vendor who can't show you a live demo of their stuff, where you can ask it questions and get to the edge of the bot, you got to ask, what do they do? All right? These are all things you should ask. You have a question. How is the correct response rate is determined is the question. It's, did the bot understand what they were asking, and did the bot deliver the answer the, the, the client wanted? So if somebody has it measured, yeah, AI looks at it, right? So all AI, natural language processing, the way natural language processing works is it looks at a, it looks at a set of words and it makes a determination, a confidence factor on how confident it is it had the right answer, right? And what I mean by that is it may say, okay, um, if somebody said bathrooms, right? A bot's going to have a really high confidence rate that you're looking for the bathroom and it's going to show you the bathroom. If you said, gosh, I had four cups of coffee today and then I had a granola bar and honestly I haven't been feeling that well and I'm feeling a little sweaty and things aren't going that well, but I really like to visit the restroom maybe a little later so I can, you know, pop a squat, right, or whatever, right? The bot's not going to understand all that. It's not going to know where to choose where your intention was, right? And it may, it might give you the right answer, it might not. Right? And so it's, it's looking at those. And the lower confidence levels, in most cases, the bot's going to give you an I don't know. I'm not sure what you asked. Please re-ask the question. Right? So going back to the previous example, I said, somebody put into our bot a couple of months ago, I got a pee. The bot had never seen that vernacular. It didn't understand what they were asking. Now, if somebody came up to us and said, I got a pee, we'd go, I hope you have to use the bathroom. It's down there, right? Um, the bot said, I don't know. Please try again. And they said, oh, where's the bathroom? Right? So it delivers that out. Um, and by the way, a correct response is also, I don't have the right answer. Somebody says, hey, what's the weather in Bali right now? And the bot says, I don't know, right? That's the correct response because you don't want the bot. You're not paying the bot to deliver Balinese weather. Does that make sense? I can, I can give you a more technical discussion shortly, okay? Okay. All right. What should getting started be like? It should be pretty simple, 
right? It should be a six to eight week process. Your vendors should be able to harvest most of the information from your systems. They should be able to integrate really intelligently so you don't have to do that much work, all right? Now, I wanna give you a couple of case studies. How many of you guys have heard of BizBash Betty? Early on, I introduced David Adler right when we started. He's from BizBash, right? BizBash uh, Betty was hired to deliver information for uh, their shows. They did one in Florida, one in uh, LA, one in New York. It's now done nine shows uh, over three years, has over 96% correct response rate and over 70% 70, 70 engagement rate. She now responds to more than 100 topics over 8 million different ways. So you can ask about those topics 8 million different ways and deliver that answer out. There's been tens of thousands of questions that that organization doesn't have to answer because the bot does answer, right? And it's identified lots of new needs, all right? Um, taking a look at one of the things we encourage you to think about is think of the chatbot as a team member, not just as technology, right? Incorporate it into your organization, right? You, you, you think Betty's not a team member? They made her an apartment. This is literally a picture of Betty's apartment that they put out where she was part of the team, right? Well, people got to the point where they were asking for Betty, right? So it's, it's about making the technology work for you. All right, let's give you another example. How many of you guys have heard of Pelotonia? It's the largest cancer ride in America. It's in Columbus, Ohio. 30,000 bikers ride a 5K, 10K, 30K, 50K, 75K, right? Here's the crazy part. Nearly 70% of them show up in a three-hour window, right? And they have to ride right after that. Well, they used badge scanners, so we delivered the badge over the, uh, over the bot, and they were able to save 6,000 minutes of rider time because they could scan and get their, their, their jersey or their vest and go as opposed to wait and get all their information. Well, that's an awful lot of time saved getting through the registration. Uh, the bot answered over 21,000 questions from 8,000 people in a two hour period, right? Um, it got to the point, so they, they actually had a news interview, a, uh, a news segment asking for Tanya because they were so excited. The news team was asking, so excited about Tanya. They had to say, well, Tanya doesn't actually exist. She's she's an AI chatbot because people were coming to their offices asking to meet Tanya. Okay. Finally, how many of you heard of the Premier Lacrosse League, right? Brand new, newest newest professional sports league, right? The reason I bring it up, it's I, I realize it's a little different than traditional expos. They move their entire league every week. So every 12, every 12 weeks, they're putting another expo on every six days, right? Every six days, they have thousands of people coming to a new location. And they've been using the bot to deliver the answers about where is it, when is it, what time does it start, who's playing this week, what time are they playing, which players have the most goals. All that information is delivered. Now, here's the real powerful thing. They push, and this gets back to the concept of community. They pushed a message out after their first week and said, hey, for everyone that had touched the bot, everyone that had touched in on SMS, if you'd like a discount on swag, buy a t-shirt, click here. 45% click-through rate. That's not an open rate, that's click-through. 45% of the people ended up in the shop buying stuff. Anybody else got a 45% click-through rate in your marketing? Right? All right, it's a spectacular interaction. Okay. Let's talk one last time about sustaining versus disruptive in our marketplace. How many people have had apps at some of your events? Right, everybody. They were an amazing sustaining, a sustaining innovation, right? Think about it, they're so much better than paper guides. Right? You have all this information, it's right on your phone. It's easy to access, you can search it, it's personalized. It's really, really powerful. Now, here's the thing, why do we have apps? Why didn't we just go to the web? Why, why couldn't we just go to the web back then? Because we had crappy Wi-Fi and crappy mobile plans, right? And the reality is, and remember now how Netflix took off, right? The reality is we don't have those limitations anymore. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the amount of the amount of um, bandwidth that's moved in 2010, back when sort of apps were reaching their heyday, everybody had to have apps. There were literally 41 petabytes, right? That's a million terabytes. For those of you that like, you know care about that detail. In 2019, 3,300 3, petabytes of data is moving across this because we all have unlimited data plans, unlimited text plans, and easy access to Wi-Fi. It becomes very powerful. Okay. Finally, we think 
here's the big finish. The age of bots is here, right? We think AI chatbots are going to be the disruptive factor to change customer service because you can ask a question, get an answer. Everybody has it with 95% uh, correct response rate and click-through rates routinely above 30%. Now, oh, you want to take a picture? Go. I'll give you this slide. If you come out to me afterwards, I'll give you the slide deck. Happy to make it available. All right. Um, here's a couple of our clients. We're very proud of all the industry folks across all industries. Sports. We did NYU's graduation, 35,000 people in, in uh, Yankee Stadium. We did the National Restaurant Association, the American Association of Museums, uh, Epilepsy Foundation, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Connect. We are Con. We built Con. Right. Uh, we've won a couple of awards. We're very excited about our awards, right? Uh, won 17 awards in 24 months in the industry. All right, let's do a demo. Everybody got your phone? Get it out. Everybody get your phone out, okay? All right, text to the number two, get ready to send a text to the number 25525. That's the number you're texting. You're gonna text the word connect. Even if you've already connected, do it again for me, okay? All right? Is everyone getting the message saying, hey, I'm Connie? All right? It's coming back? All right. Think how easy it was to connect. Now I'm going to show you a bunch of cool features that even Connect doesn't have turned live yet. I want you to text the word Jackie to that same number. Text the word Jackie. Okay? And when you do, you're going to jump to another bot. All right, let me know when you've gotten there. Yeah, you're there. All right, all right. So now, you, now it says profile. Go ahead and type the word profile and click on the link it sends you. All right, you're missing out, lady. You gotta get here. You type on the word profile and now fill out the profile. You don't have to put your real information. You can put Donald Duck, Minnie Mouse, Sasha Fierce. You can put whatever you want in, right? But what you're doing is, it's that easy for you to update the information about you so that other attendees can see you. Again, put in put in BS data, have fun with it, right? Put in your favorite uh, cartoon character, all right? When you're done putting in your favorite cartoon character, now go back, right? You're gonna go back and you're gonna type in participant list. Everybody still with me? Now I actually have to catch up to you. All right, when you type participant list, click on it, and you can see the list of everybody that just joined, all you guys, right now, that you, the information you put in. All right, if you look at it, you can search. You can type in Caldwell, my last name, C-A-L-D-W-E-L-L. -L. You can type in Mickey, because I'm sure somebody put in Mickey Mouse, right? You can type that, and you can very quickly search through the information, all right? Now, go back to the bot and type in my badge. <coughs> when you do that, what you're going to get is a scannable badge, and whatever name you just put in the bot, it's going to come through and say, here's your, here's your badge, Sasha Fierce, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse whatever it might be, right? This is the power of being able to go take that badge and get it scanned for a discount or scanned to get your, how many How many people had to stand in that line today to get your badge? Yeah, it'd have been nice to be able to scan it right off your phone a little quicker. I'll bring that up with our friends at Connect. They, they, they had a <coughs> connectivity issue. They chose not to use it this year. All right, now, let's see, I got, I got just a couple minutes here. All right, type in exhibitors, right? And when you type in exhibitors, it gets you a link. Pop over to, to the exhibitor link and search. You can search on this is 500 imaginary exhibitors. Type in and type the word wood and you'll see it. It's a hot search. So it's going to give you everybody that has that anywhere in their description. It delivers it out. And I know I'm moving fast while you guys are going through it, but you get the idea. All right. All right. One, one last cool one. All right. Go back to the bot and type the word poll, P-O-L-L, -L, and take the poll. Right? We have clients that are using, go, click and take the poll.
We have clients that are using this for speaker interrogation, speaker questions, using it for continuing education. They're using it to do instant surveys. Again, it's that easy to get to that. All right, now I'm gonna show you the coolest part. How many of you guys have ever had a problem at your event and you wanted to communicate to everybody? Instantaneously, okay. Give me the, give me the, the name of a crazy problem, not like a real one like, you know, we have an active shooter at something silly. Name a problem. What is it? I can't hear that. It's clouds. Okay, it's too loud. Sure. All right. It is great that it is too loud. So I am now typing a message out. And what should we do because it's so loud? What do we tell everybody to do? How about we tell them to go get a drink? That seemed like a, a solution. All right. <laughs> All right. Hide in the restroom. Hide in the restroom. Okay. So what I've just done is I've said it's too loud. Hide in the restroom. And I've sent a message to everybody that's part of this group. Right? The next couple of seconds, you're going to get a message that was sent out automatically to you that quickly. You can now send these messages to your attendees. You can tell them, hey, there's a thunderstorm calling in. The event that was on the front lawn has now been moved to the main uh, main lodge, into the Jefferson room. Hey, the keynote speaker has been moved from 12.15 to 12.30. Hey, we decided to, uh, the buses are gonna pick us up on the south end versus the, the north end. I did that live while I'm talking to you. How many of you guys got, got that notification, right? It's that simple, it's that easy. You guys have that same functionality in your hands when you use chatbots. It's that quick to communicate. Everybody has SMS. Everybody just read that. The 12 people that were on this list ahead of time, all my employees, who got that same message, you know what they did? They all picked up their phone and looked at it. Regardless of the fact that it was nonsensical and it came from me around this, because there's a 98% open rate with text. Guys, I hope I've given you a little bit of insight. My name is Bob Caldwell. I'm super excited to have been here. Thank you for sharing the time with me. If you have questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. I'll come to you. Then you know we can we can talk out loud. If you want a copy of my slides, hang out. We'll exchange cards. I'll get them to you. Thank you guys so much for your time.